As we begin our study of the circulatory system, we're going to start by looking at the fluid in the circulatory system, the blood. Blood is a connective tissue. Now you'll remember that connective tissue was a tissue where the cells did not touch, but were rather suspended in a matrix that had a protein component and a fibrous component. The nature of the, the matrix was what accounted for connective tissue being everything from as hard as bone to as fluid as reticular tissue. In blood, the cells are the formed elements, but the matrix is the plasma. Plasma differs from other matrices in that there are no collagen or elastic fibers, and these were always found in the matrices of other connective tissues. Instead, plasma has a soluble protein called fibrinogen, and under certain conditions, fibrinogen becomes insoluble, it becomes fibrin, and that causes blood to clot. Blood components can be separated by centrifugation, and when we do that, we will get plasma, a buffy coat, and red cells. About 55% of whole blood is plasma. The buffy coat makes up less than 1% of the whole blood. Buffy coat is made of white blood cells and platelets. The erythrocytes compose about 45% of whole blood. And this particular test where we spin the blood down and separate the red cells from the plasma is called a hematocrit. In women, the hematocrit is about 42% plus or minus 5%. In men, a hematocrit is about 47% plus or minus 5%. You can divide the hematocrit by three and have a rough approximation of the hemoglobin content. Blood is scarlet to dark red depending upon the oxygen content. Oxygen makes the blood more scarlet in color. Lack of oxygen, the blood has kind of a dark mahogany red color. Blood is thicker than water. It is denser and more viscous than water. Viscosity has to do with the thickness and the stickiness of the blood. Blood pH is very narrowly controlled between 7.35 and 7.45 and its temperature is 38 degrees centigrade or 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit. When we take your body temperature, we are not getting a direct reading of the blood, but rather the blood temperature has been kind of diffused through the tissues, and that's the reading we're getting. About 8% of your body weight is blood. In men, that is about five to six liters. In women, that's about four to five liters. A liter is approximately a quart. Blood has three major functions. It distributes things throughout the body like oxygen, nutrients, waste products, and hormones. It helps regulate things like temperature, pH, and blood volume. And finally, it has a protective function. Some cells in the blood help prevent fluid loss by contributing to blood clotting, and other cells in the blood protect us from infection. Blood plasma is the straw-colored portion of the blood. It's 90% water and 10% dissolved stuff. There are over 100 different chemicals dissolved in the blood at any given time. Of all of the dissolved materials, about 8% is protein or albumin. So 8% of that 10% is this protein albumin. Albumin is what helps keep water drawn into the blood. The other 2% of that 10% is all of the other stuff traveling in the blood. The nitrogenous waste products, the nutrients, the electrolytes, and the respiratory gases. The cells of the blood are called the formed elements. The erythrocytes are the red blood cells, or RBCs. The leukocytes are the white blood cells, or WBCs. And the thrombocytes are also known as the platelet. When we look at a blood film, this has been stained with Wright's stain, you'll notice that the blood cells stain red, and they do have this central pallor that's normal for them, and they don't have a nucleus, which is also normal for them. The white blood cells pick up a variety of blue and pink colors, depending upon the structure in the cell. And then you have these little dust particles in the back. These are the platelets, which are not true cells, but just cell fragments. Red blood cells, or erythrocytes, are the cells that contain the hemoglobin. And it is the hemoglobin that carries the oxygen and carbon dioxide in our blood. Erythrocytes are also the major reason that blood is thick and sticky. It's what causes the viscosity.
If we look at cell counts, men have about 5.1 to 5.8 times 10 to the 6 red blood cells per microliter. Now a microliter is a cubic millimeter. A millimeter is that smallest measurement on a metric ruler. So if you imagine a little box that's a millimeter on each side, that's a cubic millimeter. That's how many cells are in here. Now 10 to the 6 means that this is 5,100,000 red blood cells in men. Women tend to have fewer red blood cells, 4.3 to 5.2 times 10 to the 6 red blood cells per microliter. Hemoglobin is really what's responsible for carrying oxygen, so hemoglobin values are very important. Males are 13 to 18 grams per deciliter, and a deciliter is 100 milliliters. Females have 12 to 16 grams per deciliter. The red blood cell is a biconcave disc. Here you see it with sort of caved in. It's caved in on both sides. This gives it the ability to be pretty flexible. It does not have a nucleus, so it's not a true cell. It will not undergo any cell division once it leaves the bone marrow. This flexibility that is afforded by this odd shape is what allows red blood cells to slip through tiny, tiny capillaries. Hemoglobin is what we call a conjugated protein. That is, it's a protein attached to something else. It's also a protein that shows tertiary structure. Tertiary structure is when you have two or more proteins joined together. Here we have two alpha globin chains and two beta globin chains, so there's four protein molecules, and each one of those chains is associated with a heme, which is the iron-containing portion. This is the structure that can bind to oxygen and carbon dioxide. Blood cell formation is known as hematopoiesis, and this occurs in the red bone marrow. The hematopoietic stem cell is the precursor to all blood cells. It is a true stem cell. We consider it the grandmother of all blood cells. It's known as a hemocytoblast. Some point in time when the hemocytoblast divides, the daughter cells become committed to a particular blood cell pathway. They're the mother cells for all blood cells. But once they become committed, they're going to become that particular cell. Erythropoiesis is the formation of red blood cells. So here's our grandmother cell, the hematopoietic stem cell, the hemocytoblast. Here is one of its daughter cells that has now become a committed cell. All of the cells that come from this cell will be red blood cells. It goes through several phases of development. At this point, it gets rid of the nucleus. It becomes a structure called a reticulocyte and then erythrocyte. The erythrocytes are typically what are delivered to the circulation. A few reticulocytes do end up in the circulation and they go ahead and mature to red blood cells. A reticulocyte count should be about 1 to 2 percent. That is, of the circulating red blood cells, 1 to 2 percent of them should be those rather immature reticulocytes. This is a rough index of the rate of red blood cell production. Red blood cell production, if it goes higher than normal, there would be more reticulocytes in the circulation. So a high reticulocyte count might indicate that the bone marrow is being forced to produce more red cells than normal. Erythropoiesis is hormonally controlled by the hormone erythropoietin, which is produced by the kidneys. Now erythropoietin is produced based on the ability of the blood to transport oxygen. In addition to erythropoietin, for the red bone marrow to be able to produce red blood cells, there must also be an adequate supply of iron and B-complex vitamins, particularly B12. Red blood cells will live in the circulation for about 120 days, and then they'll be removed by the liver and the spleen, primarily by the spleen. The red blood cell is broken down, the iron is saved, protein components are saved, so the red blood cell is, is recycled as much as possible. Some hemoglobin will be broken down to bilirubin in the liver, and bilirubin will be excreted in the feces. If the liver is damaged, bilirubin may not be eliminated and may build up in the blood, and this is what causes the yellow pigmentation of the skin known as jaundice. 
Testosterone is a hormone that may enhance erythropoietin production. This may account for why men have higher red cell count values than women. The triggers for erythropoietin production include a reduced number of red blood cells, which could be the result of hemorrhage or an increased destruction of red blood cells, a decreased hemoglobin per red blood cell, or reduced oxygen availability to the blood. Once the red blood cell count goes up or oxygen levels in the blood increase, then EPO production is depressed. So if we look at the homeostatic mechanism, we have normal blood oxygen levels. If they go too low, a condition called hypoxia, which may be because of a low red count, a decreased hemoglobin, or a decreased availability of oxygen, then the kidney will be stimulated to release erythropoietin. The liver can do this to a certain extent as well. Erythropoietin will stimulate the red bone marrow then to produce red blood cells. As the red blood cell count increases, the oxygen carrying ability of the blood should rise and we should go back to normal levels of blood oxygen. This would turn off the production of erythropoietin. Erythropoietin is reduced in renal dialysis patients. There is a genetically engineered form of erythropoietin that can be given to these patients so that their red cell values stay high. Erythropoietin has been abused by athletes. What they will do is they will take erythropoietin to stimulate the production of more red blood cells. The idea is they would have more oxygen carrying capacity in their blood than normal and this would enhance their performance. There are some dangers with this. First of all, remember red blood cells are responsible for blood viscosity. So if you have more red blood cells than normal, you're going to have a higher blood viscosity. The kind of exercise that athletes do tends to cause dehydration. Dehydration will reduce blood volume, increasing blood viscosity even more. One of the things we're going to find out is that blood needs to flow relatively quickly or it will clot. So if they have this sludgy kind of blood now, they're going to have increased chances for blood clotting. Those blood clots could end up in the brain, a stroke, or they could end up in the heart and they would have heart failure. Disorders involving red blood cells can be either too few cells or too many cells. If we have too few cells, we're going to have a reduced oxygen carrying capacity in the blood. This is a condition known as anemia. Reduced red blood cells can be caused by a number of reasons. One is hemorrhage. That's called hemorrhagic anemia. If the hemorrhage is rather sudden, they can replace the blood fairly quickly with a transfusion. But if the hemorrhage is a slow bleed, such as a bleeding ulcer, then the anemia may come on very slowly. They have to find the source of the bleed as well as give some red blood cells back to these people. Hemolytic anemia occurs when the red blood cells are destroyed faster than normal. This can be because the red blood cells are being damaged. People with artificial heart valves, for example, tend to damage their red blood cells more quickly than normal or because of some sort of autoimmune disease. A plastic anemia occurs if the bone marrow has been damaged and shuts down production. Chemotherapy can do this radiation can do this, and exposure to certain other chemicals like benzene can cause aplastic anemia. And then renal anemia is when the kidneys do not produce an adequate amount of erythropoietin. This can be treated with erythropoietin. There may be a reduced hemoglobin production. The red cell production is fine, but there's not enough hemoglobin. And since that's what carries the oxygen, that would give you reduced oxygen carrying capacity. There are two types of anemia that come into this category. One is iron deficiency. If the body does not have enough iron, it cannot produce hemoglobin. An iron deficiency can either be a dietary deficiency, people not taking in enough iron, or it can be a problem with the digestive system where iron is not adequately absorbed. The cells that are produced in iron deficiency anemia are smaller than normal. They're said to be microcytes.
Pernicious anemia is the kind of anemia you get when there's a B12 deficiency. Several things can cause a B12 deficiency. Certain disorders of the stomach prevent the production of intrinsic factor, which allows for the absorption of B12. In pregnancy, there may be a B12 deficiency, and there is a tapeworm infestation that causes pernicious anemia because the tapeworm takes up all the B12. Treatment for this is an adequate supply of B12 and, of course, removal of the tapeworm if that's the problem. Abnormal hemoglobins are typically the result of a genetic disorder. Thalassemias are a group of hemoglobin disorders that are seen primarily in people of Mediterranean descent. Here the hemoglobin produced does not carry oxygen appropriately. Sickle cell anemia is a situation where the hemoglobin that's produced, hemoglobin S, does not stay soluble if oxygen levels decrease in the blood. So if they're in a situation where there's a reduced oxygen level, and this could be as the result of tissues consuming oxygen rapidly, the red blood cells lose that biconcave shape and their flexibility and go into a sickle shape. These sickle cells are very fragile, so they rupture easily. So this is a hemolytic type of anemia. And of course, they don't go through capillaries well, so they tend to block capillaries, causing little infarctions. Areas of tissue do not get blood, and this can cause tissue damage. This can be treated with a drug to help prevent sickling from occurring. Polycythemia is a condition where there are too many red blood cells. As a result, the blood is very viscous, and this leads to hypertension as well as that sluggishness of the blood through the system, which can increase clotting. Primary polycythemia is the result of bone marrow cancer, so you have to treat the cancer to get rid of this one. Secondary polycythemia is usually pretty benign. It is a condition that occurs if you find yourself in a decreased oxygen atmosphere. This would cause the increased production of erythropoietin and the production of more red blood cells. Now here on the Gulf Coast, we're pretty much at sea level. So we have lots and lots of oxygen in our atmosphere. But if you were to go to Denver, the Mile High City, you might find that for the first day or two you were fatigued pretty easily because there is less oxygen in that atmosphere and you would not have enough red blood cells to carry oxygen adequately in your blood. Erythropoietin production would increase and you would make a few more red blood cells. Usually this kind of secondary polycythemia does not take you into abnormally high red cell counts, but you might come home from that Denver vacation with a slightly higher hemoglobin level than normal, which would go away as you acclimated back to the higher oxygen content at sea level. Blood doping is sort of an athletic form of polycythemia. What athletes do is they will draw off blood, and this will stimulate normal erythropoietin production to replace that blood. Then prior to the event that they're going to participate in, they'll re-inject red blood cells. This is to, of course, enhance their performance because they would have more oxygen-carrying capability. The same side effects as using erythropoietin occur. They're subject to blood clotting, heart failure, and stroke. This is considered an unethical practice in competitions, so this has been banned from the Olympic Games. The leukocytes, or the white blood cells, have the function of defending us against disease. Normally, there are 4,800 to 11,000 white blood cells per microliter in our blood. Some of the white blood cells have the ability to leave circulation. They can squeeze between the cells of the blood vessel lining. This is something called diapedesis. These cells can then circulate in the tissue where they can also have a protective function. Leukocytosis is what occurs when you have above 11,000 cells per microliter. Usually this is a normal physiological response to infection. There are different types of white blood cells. The granulocytes have lobed nuclei and very distinctive granules in their cytoplasm, and these granules stain differently when they're exposed to right stain. There are three granulocytes, neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. 
Agranulocytes have a rounded nucleus and no granules in the cytoplasm. There are two types of agranulocytes, the lymphocytes and the monocytes. Neutrophils are sometimes called polymorphonuclear cells, PMNs or polys, because they have this lobed nucleus that makes it look like they may have more than one nucleus. Their granules do not pick up any particular stain color, but you can see that that's a granular kind of cytoplasm. About 70% of the circulating white blood cells are neutrophils. Neutrophils are primarily phagocytic and they like small things like bacteria. So if we see an increase above 70% of white blood cells along with a leukocytosis, that tends to make us think there may be a bacterial infection. Lymphocytes are among the agranulocytes. Now about 30% of your white blood cells are lymphocytes. There are two types of lymphocytes. The T cells are involved in cell mediated immunity. The B cells are involved in antibody mediated immunity. These types of immunity are found when we have viral infections or fungal infections. Since viral infections are much more common than fungal infections, if we have a leukocytosis with an increase in lymphocytes, we tend to think that there's a viral infection. Monocytes are the other agranulocyte. Now they make up about 60% of the white blood cells. And if you've been keeping up with the math, we now have 106% white blood cells. I gave you the numbers 70 and 30 for lymphocytes and neutrophils because that makes it easier to remember that those are the two most common types of white blood cells. Actually, they tend to be slightly less than that. The monocytes are tissue macrophages. These are some of the white blood cells that can slip between the cells of the blood vessels and do that diapedesis thing where they get out and wander the tissues. They are phagocytic and because they are large cells, they can eat larger things than bacteria. They tend to be increased in chronic infections. Normally, neutrophils are your first line of defense for phagocytosis. If the infection persists, then the monocytes may come in as your second line of phagocytic defense. These cells are also very important in activating the immune system. Because they can get out into the tissues, they sort of have a chance to see what's going on outside the bloodstream, and that makes them an important signaling cell for the immune system. Eosinophils make up about 4% of your circulating white blood cells. Here you will see that the granules stain sort of a pink or orange color. These granules contain antihistamine, which is the same material that you can take if you have an allergic response, and they also contain digestive enzymes. Eosinophils increase in number when you have an allergy because they're trying to combat the effects of the histamine that started the allergic reaction. And because of their digestive enzymes, they're effective defending against certain parasitic worms. So another time when you'll see an increased eosinophil count is if there is an infestation with parasitic worms. Basophils make up less than 1% of the white blood cell population. Their granules stain a very dark blue, so dark that it almost obscures the nucleus. Their granules release histamine, and histamine is what initiates an inflammatory reaction. There are similar cells in the tissue called mast cells. They come from a different stem cell, but they have the same function. Now, if you want to keep up with the order of the white blood cells, you need to remember to never let monkeys eat bananas. Neutrophils are the most common, then lymphocytes, then monocytes, then eosinophils, and finally basophils. White blood cells have a lifespan that varies according to the cell. Some last a few days, some may last your entire life. Leukopoiesis, or the formation of white blood cells, is hormonally controlled. There are two groups of hormones. The interleukins are a group of hormones that are released by your immune system to help stimulate the production of white blood cells at times of infection or whenever we might need extra white blood cells for defense. Colony stimulating factors do exactly that. They stimulate different colonies of white blood cells, granulocytes or agranulocytes. 
Colony stimulating factors are commercially available, and since chemotherapy tends to depress bone marrow, many times people who are on chemotherapy need both erythropoietin and colony stimulating factors to keep their bone marrow functional and keep their white cell count and their red cell count up. Now if we look at the formation of the white cells, here's our grandmother cell, that hemocytoblast. Some of our daughter cells become dedicated myeloid cells. And the myeloid cells can either make eosinophils, basophils, neutrophils, or monocytes. The other stem cell is the lymphoid stem cell, which we get our B lymphocytes and our T lymphocytes, giving us the lymphocytes that are in the blood. One of the most common leukocyte disorders is leukemias, and we can classify leukemias based on the cell type and the speed with which the leukemia comes on. So we have myelocytic leukemias, which would be disorders of that myelocytic stem line, or lymphocytic leukemias, which are disorders of that lymphocytic cell line. Acute leukemias, have more immature cells. The most immature cells are circulating in the bloodstream. And acute leukemia tends to come on very rapidly and progress very quickly. Acute leukemias will have some of the highest white blood cell counts of 90 to 100,000 white blood cell per microliter. Chronic leukemias will show more of the later stages of the immature cells. Chronic leukemia comes on more slowly and takes longer to see full effects. Again, you will have increase of white blood cells, but this will be more like 50 to 60,000 white blood cells per microliter. What happens is because the bone marrow is so busy producing white blood cells, the bone marrow becomes packed with these immature white blood cells. The other cells, the erythrocytes and the platelets, can't be produced and can't be developed properly. So you have a bloodstream that's full of immature white blood cells, a reduced number of red blood cells, and a reduced number of platelets. But the white blood cells are immature cells. They're not functional. They don't fight against disease. And typically people with leukemia die either from infection or from internal bleeding as a result of there not being enough platelets present. Infectious mononucleosis, sometimes called the kissing disease because it's spread primarily in saliva, is actually an infection with the Epstein-Barr virus. The cells that are infected are the B lymphocytes. People who have infectious mononucleosis have chronic fatigue, sore throat, and a low-grade fever. Because it tends to occur in adolescence, it is frequently misdiagnosed initially as strep throat. But when the antibiotics don't work and the fatigue and the fever don't go away, they may then test for mononucleosis. Infectious mononucleosis is very chronic. It takes months to actually get over this disease. Leukopenias are a decreased white blood cell count. Here, there's a great risk of infection occurring because your white blood cell count is too low. Usually, leukopenias are drug-induced with the most common form of leukopenia being the result of chemotherapy.